Hi, this is Parish President Cynthia Lee Shang, and I want to welcome you to our next uh, Next Level video series. I am honored to be here with two of our directors who are very instrumental in water management for us. Um, we have Michelle Gonzalez, who is our Ecosystem uh, and Coastal Management Director, and Maggie Talley, who is our Floodplain Management Director. Maggie and Michelle, I'm thinking about our community and um, when you look at how communities form, obviously for government, you, we've been doing roads and we do um, gymnasiums and we do libraries and even the library system is from the turn of the century and, and the start of any community is roads. But when you look at the specialties that you're involved in and your disciplines, these are fairly new kind of items in, in terms of the last decades, right? I think Congress approved the act uh, in 1972. We didn't start our program until 1984, I believe. So um, very, very important to us and these conversations we're having about water management and coastal resilience and all of these things are, are just kind of new conversations that are really um, increasing even as the years go by. It's the importance of this issue, why your jobs are so important, and also because Jefferson Parish, we have actually more water square miles than we have land square miles. So just with that introduction into the importance of your work, I want you both to introduce yourselves and, and tell us a little bit about how you got involved in, in such an important, um, important issue. Sure, I'll, um, I'll kind of start a little bit again. Michelle Gonzalez, um, I've kind of been in this water management field um, since the time of Hurricane Katrina. I was, um, you know, looking, looking for a job and ended up working for FEMA um, on a regular basis. I was driving to the city of Kenner, from Baton Rouge to the city of Kenner, visiting with residents who were living in FEMA trailers and thinking, man, this, this is terrible. Like these people, all their houses have flooded. Like there's gotta be a better way. And lo and behold, there were these mitigation grants, went on to work for the state and, and really became engrossed in how do we protect properties from flooding again? And um, as a child, I remember growing up in a house that had flooded and constantly asking questions of like, hey, why does that floor look, look, look like that? And being told, oh, well that was from the flood back in 83. So it, it's constantly a reminder to me that these families that we work with in flood protection, coastal management, they, um, it's their livelihood, it's their homes, it's really important to them. And so we kind of try to take that with the, um, the mission for, our, for the departments that we're with. And for me, it's a similar story. So growing up, I um, actually grew up in Homa, which is just an hour away, and grew up in a house that flooded constantly. We had what we call nuis nuisance flooding, where you might get half an inch for every rain event that came through. It was partly due to just internal drainage um, issues. But not having ever realized that this would ever be a field that existed, right? When you're, when you're in grade school and you're being asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? The typical answers at the time were, oh, I want to be a, a teacher or a doctor, maybe a lawyer. But never did I ever consider something like floodplain manager on that list. And so for me, it wasn't until, again, for Katrina, um, as I was finishing up my degree and, and thinking about what comes next for me, um, I luckily was able to get through a program at UNO in 2006. And so really being here at ground zero of what it takes for a community to come back after a, a cat catastrophic event and um, was able to, to continue with mitigation research for the next six years and started with Jefferson Parish in this field. Um, in 2014 and so it, it sort of just was this natural path. So let's let's delve into your departments even a little bit more obviously people hear about disappearing coastlines obviously it's a very critical issue for us in Louisiana I mean we have so many industries and, and so much at stake you know the oil and gas industry we have our transportation our, our navigation channels are critical to us our commercial fishing, you know, it's it's a way of life, what we'll say, this our wildlife, it's, it's how we are as a people in Louisiana. So the Jefferson Parish Coastal Strategic Action Plan, Michelle, tell us about that and how and why it's so important to the future of our parish. After Hurricane Katrina and, and Rita back in 2005, the state created um, a coastal master plan. And we at Jefferson have had various plans that we've put together of, of kind of how do we want to look at coastal restoration. and so. Last year, we really kind of decided, let's take it to the next level. Let's do a strategic action plan, not just a list of projects, not just what we've done in the past, but identifying what is the problem in Jefferson Parish, in the Barataria Basin, in the Pontchartrain Basin, and what are the projects that might kind of be that turning the tide maybe for, for the area. And so that's what we're really trying to, to dig in and say, if we did this one first, or if we did this project second, this is where it's gonna make 
the biggest impact for the, the next um, few years and, and even into the next generation. And it's sometimes hard for people who, who live in the greater New Orleans area and in the upper Jefferson Parish to, to understand if you've never traveled and look, I mean, I talk to our council members all the time. We have many of our council members who just grew up in that area fishing in those waters, right? And, and really can know their way back there. It's sometimes hard for people in the upper Jefferson area to realize the importance of down the, the lower part of our parish and, and how it protects us from, from storms and how we call it, it's, it's the speed bump before it gets to us, right? Um, Ex exactly, we have so many um, marshes and um, various protections that are between us and, and we have a levee system. Again, it's often referred to as a multiple lines of defense, but we've gotta have those barrier islands, we have to have the marshes, we need all of this to protect where the bulk of our population is um, while keeping that way of life in our coastal communities. I was in Grand Isle two summers ago with a friend of mine and she was pointing out, we were standing on the, on the beach and she says, I remember as a teenager, the beach went that far out. Do you see that rock? It, like it, we just in that short period of time, just from when we were in high school, she can just remember where she used to walk, which is all water now. And that's a very fast level of disappearing coastline, obviously. Maggie, so the floodplain management, I think the first time I really got into your department was when um, we were looking at the, bud, the base flood elevation maps. And I think that's a very critical piece of what every homeowner, it, it affects them, but they might not even know about your department and, and how critical your work is. So talk to, talk to us about that. And I know you put out a series of videos um, to, to get people aware and, 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 and of how important it is and what you offer. We had new flood insurance rate maps become effective in 2018. That process is a very long drawn out FEMA process. Our maps prior were from 1995. And so for over 20 years, you, we were working from the same maps that basically were ex explaining what the risk is to flooding in our area. But as you know, as we all know that, um, you know, we, we implement drainage projects all the time. We have new development that comes in all the time. I mean, we're constantly changing our landscape and with that, we're changing our risk. And so it is important to get updated maps over time because we want to account for all those changes and understand what the real risk of flooding can be for various areas. Now, we'll say one of the main differences um, in the two maps is we saw a lot of improvements because of all the work we've been implementing, such as a lower base flood elevation or a better flood zone, meaning a lower risk as opposed to a higher risk. However, what's important to understand and what we really work hard to message in our, from our department is that you know, where we live in South Louisiana, we're all at risk. And that risk can, you know, can change in the drop of a hat. Any one event, every, every rainstorm that comes through is a unique event. And so, um, you know, we, we do encourage that everyone purchase flood insurance. If they have questions about their flood risk, about their flood maps, you know, our office is a great, um, it, it's that, that's why we're here, is to help answer those questions. Um, and, and then regarding the videos that you mentioned, so we do have some videos on our website that highlight our grant programs, and this is really more geared toward residents who've experienced multiple uh, floods or might have um, kind of regular flooding at their house. We really highlight the elevation and the reconstruction programs that we implement through my office, and so with an elevation, obviously you're elevating that existing house to above the risk of flooding. We call that the base flood elevation. We also have a reconstruction program in which the house that's there is demolished and then rebuilt as an elevated house. And so the idea is to, again, bring in more resilient infrastructure and housing so that the parish has um, you know, housing that's gonna withstand future storm events and in other conditions that we know are, are, are really worsening over time, such as sea level rise, coastal erosion, subsidence, and, and those kinds of things. And so anyone who's interested in, in viewing those videos, ideally what it's going to do is provide them with an overview of how the grant works, kind of demystify that process. It takes them from the beginning to end of as far as how you apply versus, okay, you've gone through the process, you've picked a contractor, you've um, signed your contract, and, and ultimately you've gotten now an elevated structure and what that means for, you know, for, for those people. It's from the perspective of two residents who've actually gone through the program, and so they're speaking from their own experience, and um, we just really think they're, they're a great tool and resource. Yeah, because it can be an intimidating process, obviously. It's you're talking about construction, but also trying to manage and maneuver your way through a grant program. Absolutely, and with it being federal, you know, it's federally funded, and so there, it's, it's external. A lot of pieces are external to what we have here just within a local um, sort of regulatory uh, idea. 
Um, and with that comes time as well. And so it's helping to manage expectations that you apply for a grant, but that doesn't mean you're going to have an elevated house two months from now. You know, it's going to take probably a year to just get approved, first of all, and then, you know, six months to another year to actually get the, the house constructed and, and elevated and mitigated. So let's reiterate that, you know, no matter your base flood elevation, if, if, if flood insurance is not required, and I don't know how many properties we would have in Jefferson Parish that does not require flood insurance. Like you said, we live in South Louisiana. Today, the day we're filming this, it's terrible rain outside. I mean, uh, the risk is always there, and we would encourage everybody to uh, have a flood insurance policy. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, Michelle, about the greenhouse. And the, and the sapling program. Talk, talk to us about that. That's an exciting piece and that's very next level for us in Jefferson Parish. So, so this is something that I was really encouraged about whenever I first um, came in with the Coastal Management Group. Um, they had worked with the Parkways Department and recognized that there was a greenhouse on the Parkways um, site that had plenty of room for us to grow native species in. So we worked on a grant. Um, last summer we got a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency they provided funds so we could repair some of the watering system in the greenhouse. So now it's on an automatic waterer, so we don't have to have staff there on a daily basis to water these plants. But we've been growing cypress trees. Also, many of the cypress trees were purchased with these EPA grant funds. So really trying to maximize resources that we have. But we were able to grow them in the greenhouse. We even have a little bit of space outside that once they get too tall for the greenhouse, really trying to get these plants acclimated to being in a coastal environment. We did a planting event with some volunteers in February. We had about 10 people come out so that we could remain socially distanced in the boat that we had. These volunteers worked very hard over the three, three hour period. They planted 750 trees. We do this in an area very close to where we do our um, Christmas tree recycling program. And part of the big goal is to get native species, cypress trees, other, other species in the ground to lessen the coastal erosion that we're seeing on these various shorelines. But also it's a way to, a low cost way to get volunteers hands on in the marsh, touching the dirt, in a boat, talking about letting them see that the area surrounding the community of Lafitte is not that far away. There's still cell reception. You know, you can see um, Plaquemines from there. You can see the oil refineries and things. And so it was just really encouraging for me to see these volunteers wanting to, to make a difference. Um, and this is something that we hope to continue, but also put the research behind it. How are these trees doing? How is the land looking in the, um, over the next few years to see if we're doing it the right way or in the right place? I think that's what's fascinating. We have so many, our natural habitat, obviously, and we have so much wonderful local expertise. If you're talking about trees that help with the integrity and, and just slowing, um, you know, the, the erosion, but also, you know, from the green infrastructure pieces, we talk about um, plants that absorb water better to help us with our drainage and not pumping so much, right? So it's, it's really, there's so many issues with water management. I mean, you know, and, and these issues kind of bleed over to so many of our other departments in Jefferson Parish. So um, we're fortunate to have you all exclusively dedicated to this, but um, it's a big topic that you could just continually, like I feel like I'm, I'm a constant student, and the more I talk about this, and I, you know, I realize how much I don't know. Just when you, when you, this is one of those topics where you learn a little, you realize like I really don't know about this because it is such a vast um, book of knowledge there. Um, okay, so your, your departments work together. I mean, obviously we created both of your departments. You're separate because there's so much work to be done, but explain how you all fit together and interlink and, and why it makes sense that you two are both working together all the time. So one of, one of the most interesting pieces um, with both Maggie and, and I's department. So Maggie's department with the name floodplain management and hazard mitigation. So it kind of has these, these two fold points. And, and so I, I mentioned that because the parish's hazard mitigation plan. Like we've really tried to take that to the next level saying, okay, what are the hazards that we have in the parish? We've got things like storm surge, subsidence, sea level rise, coastal erosion, flooding. So just in those five hazards that we're trying to create mitigation goals and plans and projects for shows how the departments work together on a regular basis. But one of the biggest pieces of that hazard mitigation plan that we feel like Oftentimes we may have a flood problem and that's a drainage project and so we'll work with the drainage department to take care of it. But through our departments we try to facilitate the education. 
the outreach to citizens. And so we had two small departments um, of about three staff members trying to, to do a lot. And so now that we've kind of combined forces, it, it's giving us that ability to divide and conquer type of a thing. We, um, we have better, better use of resources, even things like paying invoices. Now we don't, both departments don't have to have a clerk to pay invoices, we have one. And it's made day-to-day -day operations easier. Um, and we, we feel like as this summer and, and moving forward, when we really start to get out in the public, it's gonna be this, this joint effort showing how purchasing flood insurance goes hand in hand with restoring the coast. Like you've gotta have that multiple lines. We talk about the ecosystem experience and I know we have a boat and I, I, I want you to talk about that and the outreach because I think this is one of those issues that is so critical. Obviously this past year, we've all been in COVID and we haven't been doing the outreach that we would like to, but um, as we get past that, hopefully, and we're able to get into classrooms. And I think this is one issue that, you know, if you're a young boy or a young girl, and you, like Maggie, you were saying, you didn't know about this when you were younger. You didn't grow up thinking you would be this, but how incredible would that be that just to introduce that or have students actually go see it and realize there is a, a line of work here for me because some some kid is gonna be passionate about this and, and d doesn't even know about it now and it's in, you know at their back door. Um, talk to us about those outreach efforts when we're able to do so and, and how important you think they are. One of the efforts we're working on is we're going to go into summer camps this, this summer um, and we have some hands-on models that are hoping, our hope with those are to really give people, give students that, I, that, that touch and see experience where they're understanding the concepts but through this activity, right? And so one of them is called a, um, a flood plain model, and which essentially is going to mimic rain events. And so it has the ability to have varying levels of sort of rain severity. You can do a light drizzle to a really heavy downpour like we saw today. It pours over a parking lot that then falls into sort of your terrain of, of a community, of an area. And so what's really cool about this is that you can build in these sort of little mitigation measures that show how you're changing that landscape and thus affecting possible flooding. So you have the option to perhaps put a retention area underneath a parking lot. And then you can see how those cars that are parked there now, when you go to get in that car, your feet aren't gonna be soaking wet into a, you know, a, a foot of, of water. That water then, you, can, you have little clay pieces that you can create like these levees with, or you have monopoly houses that you can place in different locations and really see how playing with that topography uh, can really impact or change you know, how an area floods and takes on water. It's a really cool model. We're excited to start you know, putting that out and just getting the perspective from the student's point of view of what, what really resonates with them, um, what makes sense, what doesn't quite make sense. So it helps us to better target and, and kind of engage uh, moving forward too of how we can address those things that maybe don't make as much sense as, as they might to us. So really excited for that. And then um, the coastal side has a, a lot of exciting ones too. Well, just on that, you know, you can put a paragraph and explain something, you know, with words in front of a student. But when I'm a visual learner, when they see that, it's so quick, if they just get it right away. I mean, that's that's critical, those kind of models in the classroom. Michelle? Yeah, we have, we have one other model, a, a hands-on model that we've used in the past, but really excited to kind of use it this year. It's, it's kind of a, a big plastic bin tub that we had a, um, an AmeriCorps volunteer created it for us about a year and a half ago. It, in a lot of ways, mimics the multiple lines of defense that I keep talking about. You've got like open water, and then you have some marsh area and then a little bit of like a little slope to show how the houses are built a little higher. Well, that, that marsh area is just fake grass. We can take it in and out. So when it's out, we create these waves, let the students get in there with the water and kind of a, create waves. And you can see how high it goes up on the land. And then we run the model again by pa placing this um, fake grass in there and really showing how just that weight breaks those waves down and kind of shows the, um, how storm surge and, and it creates a, a benefit. Really demonstrating that keeping the marsh in our area is so important to slowing down the wave action, which is going to lessen the storm surge that goes to our, our populated communities. Okay, so I want to be a tag along when you go in the classroom, <laughs> get it on my schedule. Oh, no, we'd love to have I, you. Yeah, I would yeah. love, I'd love and to be. We, we definitely want to do it in classrooms, but we're trying this summer, like Maggie mentioned, in the summer camps, the Jefferson Parish Recreation Summer Camps, we're working with them at two different ones. and so. Um, that's, we want to be a partner with other parish departments mm -hmm. and that's one of the big things that we're, we're trying to say like, hey, they have students coming in, let us talk to them about these, these items. And that's one thing that I love about all of the directors when we 
came in, new council and new administration, we, you know, we realized the importance of the departments working together and not just staying in your own lane and doing well in your own lane. So I love that you're trying it out in-house first with our own, you know, recreation department. Um, one of the great volunteer um, efforts in our parish, I think, that I've, I go to um, is the tree recycling project. I mean, it's just a fun day. It, it's just hard work, but everybody can see, you know, the changes being made and, and how important it is. So talk to us about that. So that is maybe one of the longest running volunteer type projects that we have in the parish. This year we had our 31st year. Each year it kind of evolves and yet stays the same. So it's, it's a really interesting project. Individuals, they place their Christmas tree at the curb on the assigned days. Um, we work with the garbage collection company. They pick up these trees. They're delivered down to a yard in Lafitte where we have, um, again, working with streets and parkways, they help us to get all of them stacked into the right piles and locations. And then on a specific day, we have volunteer boats coming from a lot of different agencies. I think some of our most boats come from like Kenner Police Department, Kenner Fire. We've got our emergency management boats, um, a lot of just flat bottom type of boats that easy to get the trees in and get them out to the marsh. But that takes a lot of volunteers. People have to hand, handle each one of these trees. With COVID this year, we had a lot of thought of like, hey, we don't want to stop this. We don't want these trees just going to a landfill. So how can we do this in a, in a safer way? We assigned captains, like pod, like a pod captain, and that ended up turning to be really successful. Rather than our departments looking for 60 volunteers, I found eight people who were dedicated to come on that day, and they reached out to people that they knew they could count on. And so, you know, on the day of, we had 60 or so volunteers, and they were all sectioned off into various groups. They stayed with their group for the day, I saw camaraderie between like groups. They would be like, hey, we've gotten our pile down faster than you. But the biggest thing is seeing those trees out in the, um, the cribs that we create. It's slowing the wave action down the area that we've been putting trees for at least the past 15 years. You can see a substantial difference from the left side and the right side of the pen. And just wanting to continue that in the future, certainly encourage people to place their trees at the curb, let us pick it up. Um, don't, don't just throw your tree away. We'll get it in the marsh in its correct location. It's incredible to see because every time I go down there and watch it, it's like professionals working. It's all volunteers, but everybody is just working so hard and, and they work like clockwork. The boats just keep coming around okay. and they load them so quickly. And I, re I know people are giving directions to people, but it just looks like all worker bees just going at it, you know, all day long. And so um, kudos to you on that, and, and we want to encourage, you know, hopefully this year we can get more volunteers out there. It'll be different, and it's an outdoor event, so it's it's a safe event, yeah. Anything else that I'm, I may have missed because you all do so much work? Anything else that you want to add? So there is one more exciting thing that we um, have been growing, which is Marsha the Pelican, and Marsha is our mascot. We created her about five years ago in response to a strategic outreach plan that we created called the Program for Public Information. And this was a new activity under our community rating system, which helps communities to, to earn points and therefore provide discounts on flood insurance to its residents. And so we, we work very hard on, on the CRS program. Marsha has just been a really fun instrumental piece for us and is now becoming more of a joint effort as well because you know, she was created originally to help put out information regarding flood safety and, and promoting flood insurance and, and those kinds of things. But you know, now that we've updated our hazard mitigation plan yet again, and we've identified 14 different hazards, you know, she's kind of the, the illustration that goes with each of those hazards. And we've really been able to work on creating a lot more activity sheets with her, coloring pages, things that can go to either a kindergartner all the way up to you know, your senior citizen. She's on pens and on bags and, and lots of fun things like that. And recently we've created some friends for her because we've been working on an endangered species assessment plan as well and identified several species that are within Jefferson Parish that are endangered and so we're putting them together. We have four that we're highlighting. One of them is a piping plover. We've named Piper. There's Tina the leatherback turtle. We have Manny the manatee. Stu the pallid sturgeon. And so we haven't created a lot of messaging with them yet but that's part of like trying to make sure that we we're continually reaching for how do we take something that we've created and make it better and make it more informational but you hate to just put out another flyer about endangered species. Like, let's bring it to life and... Um, yeah, and try to be a bit more engaging mm -hmm. to the public. And so that's our goal, and um, it's been really fun seeing it all come to life. Well, I look forward to being out and doing more community outreach with both of you. I just want to 
thank you so much for um, your efforts and the work that you do is going to be visible from, for generations to come. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.